This is The Joe Gaither Show on BamaCentral.com. Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa, Internet World, West Alabama, everywhere that you're watching The Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. Of course, I am Joe Gaither. This is BamaCentral.com. You're watching us on YouTube at Bama Central. You're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Amazon. You can always find me at Joe Gaither 6 on all the social media platforms. You can find me live on Facebook and on Twitter at Joe Gaither 6. And then you can connect with me on Instagram and all the other social medias as well at Joe Gaither 6. If you want to send me any of your comments, questions, queries, and complaints and be a part of today's show. So we're going to have a fun show. It's a Monday show. We hope everybody had a great weekend. We invite everybody to jump in. And join us on the show and please uh, tell a friend about the program and tell a friend about our other Bama Central Broadcasting Network podcast and show Blue Collar Unplugged. Our guys Blake Byler, Matthew Gibson and Jacob Pickle bringing you all things Alabama basketball and of course that's where we want to start today. The Crimson Tide winning on Saturday taking down Texas A&M 100 to 75. Now we're going to talk about Alabama basketball on Saturday. We're going to talk how it relates to NCAA seating. We'll mix in a little Mark Sears talk into that. Then we're going to talk about Alabama football. We're going to talk about the Crimson Tide hiring two coaches. Look, uh, kind of interesting that we talked on fr- on the Friday show about, oh my gosh, what are they going to do? Are they going to leave these uh, options vacant? There's not much smoke out here. Well, Alabama hired Chip, let's say it together, uh, Cap- Cap- Kapilovic, Kapilovic uh, the offensive line coach, uh, formerly of Michigan State and a little bit of time at Baylor, spending the last couple of months at Baylor. Chip Kapilovic, Kapilovic. We're gonna we're gonna learn how to say that together. Kapilovic is kind of how I've got that uh oh, coming out of my mouth. And then Brian Ellis is gonna serve as the tight ends coach, and we'll talk about that as well. We'll hit at the end about uh we'll go out to the diamond and find out how the how the uh, baseball and softball team did over the weekend, and then we'll finish with a little bit of gymnastics. Does that sound good to you? It sounds good to me. You can jump in and join us at Joe Gaither Six on all the social media machines, and let's get it rolling with. Who Oops. Okay, so if you were in there in Coleman Coliseum on Saturday, you had a blast, really. Uh, a great opportunity, a, a great Saturday morning. You know, you got in there, Alabama basketball handled its business, and you got out of there uh, and you enjoyed the rest of your day. Uh, but, so okay, okay, so Texas A&M. Coming off a loss to to what Vanderbilt, to, uh, a midweek loss to Vanderbilt, and really uh, Coach Buzz, Buzz Buzz Williams calling it inexcusable in the press conference. He said we took two devastating losses in uh, in different fashions this week. Uh, okay, so they're they're coming into Coleman Coliseum. Alabama's off a bye, and basically you shoot the lights out. You continue to shoot the lights out uh, from three, and, and really what you made a uh, forty. Oh, you made eighteen of forty one uh, from beyond the three-point arc, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, and uh, you, anytime you can make, you know, double-digit three-pointers, you're, you're having a, g- a good day. Let me let me see if I can uh, pull up my, my the stats that I saw from three. Jordan. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so Alabama hit 18 of 41 uh, from, from, beyond, from beyond, the, uh, beyond the arc. Sorry, I can't do multiple things at once while my pets are in the background fighting. Hey. Hey, 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 you guys need to chill out. Y'all need to chill out. We're trying to be live here, and uh, you're letting the people see how bad you guys act on a daily basis. Uh, All right, so – the biggest issue with me, uh, or the biggest thing for me was Alabama shooting so well from the three-point line, but getting out-rebounded. Out-rebounded terribly. Uh, yeah, yeah, y'all need to calm down. Uh, out-rebounded horribly, uh, but but, but, it didn't, but it didn't matter. Uh, look, anytime Alabama can get the three-point shot going, Mark Sears with another 23 points. You had the uh, Grant Nelson making his only three-point shot of the game. Everybody who, basically, who took a three-pointer made one, and look, it took Latrell right cell to get going. He had what zero points in the first half. Uh, he but he ended with 16 points. Rylan Griffin with another uh, 17. Basically, all four guards got it going at different points in the game, and all four guards contributed. Uh, and that you see what makes Alabama uh, very, very difficult to beat. But really, when you look at the competition, you look at Texas AM coming into Alabama, you say, okay, yes, any SEC win is a good win, it absolutely is. But 
A&M, 43rd in the net uh, coming into the game, and, uh, so that makes it a quad two win. And, and, and it's uh, look, any win is a good win, and it's much more important to win the game for SEC standings uh, more so than the NCAA seedings, and we'll get into the NCAA seedings here in just a little bit. But uh, you, you've got uh, – let me see – Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I knew I, I knew I had these stats pretty pretty close. Okay, so Alabama at home this year uh, has shot forty two percent throughout the entire season, and so anytime you can get that, uh, you're going to be hard to beat, especially when you're putting up 40, 40 something three threes on the game. You shot forty four percent. Hey, we're talking here. You shot 44% on Saturday, uh, basically among how many different players hit three? One, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different players uh, hit three point shots. Just makes you tough to guard. You look at Texas A&M, they're coming off a loss. Yes, they were projected to pretty highly in the SEC, but they're just offensively challenged. On, on their end, they, you know, they, rebounded, they, they rebounded the heck out of the basketball, but they needed it because they couldn't shoot worth a lick. They shot 17% from the three-point line, four of 23. And you look at their two guys, uh, t- look, Tyrese, uh, t- Tyrese Radford and Wade Taylor, and yeah, Radford got off for 22 points and and and. and he had a, a pretty nice game, uh, but he shot 10 of 17, which is not horrible, but it's not great. Uh, and then you look at Wade Taylor. He was, uh, what, 4 of 15. So you had uh, Rylan Griffin on him the entire game. It was just a bad matchup for Texas A&M. It's a game that Alabama should have won, expected to win. Uh, we talked about it on, on the Friday program. I think Alabama was a nine, nine-and-a-half-point favorite going into the game. It on the Friday program, we predicted a 15 point win, uh, and, and you got that. I mean, you got that, and then some with the 25 points. Uh, Alabama really impressive performance offensively, uh, but just concerning to me. I mean, defensively, still concerning, and rebounding, still concerning uh, for me because I mean, you look at uh, the rest of the games down the stretch, and you know, those areas will be tested further, and the, the, that'll give you more opportunities to prove yourself. And we'll get into the rest of the SEC results here in just a little bit. But but you look at the defense and the rebounding disparity. Uh, Mississippi, uh, Texas A&M beats you on the glass. Where do I have it on my notes? Uh, 49-38 to 38 on the glass. And they beat you on the offensive glass 26-14. to 14. Now, you did okay, uh, I guess. You did okay uh, defending the second attempts. Uh, and obviously their, 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 uh, their percentage, their make percentage was pretty low. Uh, 38 38 percent from the floor but but i mean they took more shots than you how often do you see another team come in uh to coma coliseum and get more shots more field goal attempts up than alabama uh i know obviously the 25 point win you can say joe what, what are you worried about but they took more shots than you because they beat you up on the glass uh 21 second chance points for texas saying now you eliminate those 20 those second chance points let's just say you cut them in half make it 10 second chance points. And that's pretty reasonable. I mean, you, the other team gets scholarships too. And they had the uh, best, uh, they came into Coleman Coliseum, the best rebounding team uh, in the SEC, the best offensive rebounding team in the SEC. And Anderson Garcia with another 12 point, re, uh, 12 rebounding effort. Uh, but but you cut that in half. You cut that in half and you say, look, Alabama won by 25. You cut that in half, the second chance opportunities uh, right there in half. And you say, what's that? 75 minus uh, minus 10 is puts you at 65. Like you're 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 looking at a 35, and it was a dominant point win. But you're looking at an even more comfortable win if you're able to rebound the basketball uh, at a more efficient rate, if you're able to combine both ends of the floor. And you're not always going to shoot at the 44%. Uh, the, the stat, the stat, these stats come from Jordan Harper, and I should have had it pulled up earlier. Hey, 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 we need to calm it down here. Y'all are wrestling. Uh, do I need to let some of y'all out? Hey, whoo, calm it down. We're getting excited. 
Look, these stats come from Jordan Harper, and it just shows that Alabama shoots so much better at home than they do on the road. 42% at home for the season. 193-point makes out of 450. Uh, compared to neutral side games, that's against Purdue, against Arizona. Uh, that's in, in in Birmingham. I think that was against Liberty, right? Uh, in neutral side games, games that you're going to play in the tournament, tournament sites, essentially, 35%. takes a big drop off. I mean, I know it's only seven seven percent, uh, but every per- percent point is a big drop off. Of uh, fifty nine makes out of one hundred and sixty eight opp- opportunities. Now it's a much smaller sample size. It is all right. Uh, then you go on the road, and Alabama is even worse thirty one percent from beyond the arc. And so yeah, it was great to beat. Texas A&M at home, and, and it's nice uh, to, to, to get that win and to see everybody score a lot of points and to see the three-point ball fall, fall. But there's just concerns for me defensively. You look at a and they scored 1.087 points per game. Uh, that's pretty far off from Coach Nate Oates' 0.7 points per game kind of goal. Now, uh, where is Alabama? Where did Alabama move up or down in, in defensive efficiency? Let's pull up our buddy Ken Pomeroy and find out Alabama, who is sixth now. Now in Ken Palm, Alabama's de- uh, adjusted defense is now 74th. And you want to get into that top 70. You really want to break into the top 50. Oh, my gosh. I mean, now it's a little, probably a little bit too late for that in the season to move up that far. But you look at teams that are ahead of you. Tennessee uh, in, in Ken Palm. Fifth in Ken Palm, fifth in the adjusted defensive efficiency. Uh, Houston, number one in Ken Palm, number one in adjusted defensive efficiency. Arizona, they put they put it to, to you out there in Phoenix, uh, number four in Ken Palm, number twelve in adjusted defensive uh, efficiency. Purdue, they beat you to a number twenty in adjusted defense. Uh, these, these teams are playing good defense, really good defense. Connecticut, number eleven in defense, number three in offense. You combine both things together, they, I mean Alabama's. Offense is historic. Uh, I think my buddy Blake Byler said Alabama's adjusted offense is now. Let me see if it, if it's right here. A hundred and twenty-six. Is that what I saw? Uh, yeah, no, one hundred twenty-seven. One hundred twenty-seven point one. Yeah, it's the number one adjusted offense in the country. It's great. You can make these three-point shots all day long, but you're going to have to – some of these games are going to come down to a defensive stop. And Texas A&M was never really going to be able to score with you. And so, while it's nice to win, and absolutely it's nice to win. You're happy about it. You never want to lose. And you needed to win to maintain your lead in the SEC standings. And your lead got a little bit better, or a little bit bigger, thanks to your friends in Kentucky and LSU. But – Outside of, okay, you, you you won the basketball game. You handled your result. You did what you needed to do. Uh, after a week off, after an entire week, uh, you know, you got the midweek off, and Coach Oates talked about talked about uh, it being, it talked about it being, oh, we're going to work on defense. We're going to work on uh, Monday, Tuesday defense. We're going to give you Wednesday off. We're going to come back and start working on A&M. But everything's going to be about defense. Uh, to have the effort, I mean, the effort was good. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't horrible on Saturday. Absolutely. I'm not going to call it that. That out by any means, but the execution on the offensive end. Now, I understand AM plays a different style and the styles clash and it doesn't always work out. And you've seen the results for NATO. It's against Buzz Williams, uh, against Texas Tandem. They haven't really been good until uh, Saturday. I mean, going into Saturday, your only win was the SEC championship game, uh, what, 12, 11 months ago uh, up there in Nashville. You were one and three. NATO was one and three against Texas AM, was. Uh, <laughs> It had zero wins. 0-3. Oh, and 0-3 uh, oh, oh against the Aggies in SEC regular season play with, what, two of those losses coming in Coleman Coliseum? Yeah. So – it was a good. It was great to get the result that you wanted to get. Uh, to to kind of flip it against a program that's kind of had your number for a little bit. But was it the best? Uh, was it the best game as far as progress for the team? I don't really think it was because we know they shoot shoot well. We've known that they can shoot well at home at Colby Coliseum. Uh, what for the last? 
two and a half months that we, 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 we've kind of understood that that's a fact of this, this year's Alabama basketball team, that they can go, that anytime the lights are on at Coleman Coliseum, they're going to shoot the basketball fairly well from three. And you're going to have to get up to a pretty high number. I mean, Alabama is uh hit they, what they hit uh, their eighth. Uh, what was it? Their eighth game at a hundred points or more this season. And how many of those games came, came at home? Uh, seven of them. Well, let's go through and count them. Morehead state, one, Indiana State, South Alabama, that's three at home right there. And then uh, Eastern Kentucky is at home. Now, Liberty, you're at a neutral site game. So, okay, there you go. There, there, there's one away. Uh, LSU is at home. And then LSU, you are at, on the road. And then a &M. So, six of your eight games that you've scored 100 points or, or more have come in Coleman Coliseum. We know that you can score. And I look, do I love the offense? Uh, hell, yeah, it's a lot of fun. But what will it be when you get on neutral site game, uh, in neutral site arenas, neutral site play? Now, now Alabama has had success uh, in the past in Nashville, and you've gotten to the Sweet 16 twice under Nate Oates, so you got to give them credit there. But uh, you got to just kind of wonder how this is going to play out going down the, down the line. Now, if you look at our buddy Ken Pomeroy as he continues to project the rest of the season, Alabama basketball with what six games left? One, two, three, four, five, six games left. Uh, Kenny Pomeroy has Alabama projected to win the SEC regular season, largely because of what happened on Saturday, and largely because of how it plays out going forward. Now, Alabama's schedule is not very very kind going forward, but because it played out on Saturday in your favor, look, you might be looking at Nate Oates' third regular season title out of five years, and how impressive would that be based on everything that was lost in the offseason, the three uh, the three assistant coaches, everybody, you know, jumping in the transfer portal and losing the M NBA prospects uh, left and right, and you you know, you wish those NBA prospects well uh, in the transfer portal ease, the, the, the best that they can be. Uh, but it was a tough offseason for Alabama basketball, let's be honest. And a true mark of a top-tier program is can you turn over? Because, look, the blue bloods of the world are recruiting at such a high level where they're turning over, maybe maybe not the talent at the same sort of level uh, that, that Alabama did last year, but they're turning over at a high rate. You know, you're getting one and dones at a regular rate. Uh, to see Alabama bounce back, to see NATO, it's rebuild the roster uh, and rebuild his coaching staff. And it seems like the coaching staff is pretty cohesive. Uh, it's just incredible. And it might show you that it's time to consider Alabama basketball. Look, who knows what they're going to do in March Madness. But it might be, uh, look, if you haven't been convinced by the recruiting classes of the last four years and of the next recruiting class that sits there in the top ten again with two McDonald's All-Americans, if you haven't been convinced by that, it might be time to consider Alabama basketball a premier basketball program in college basketball. I mean, okay, it's not North Carolina, but you're sitting right there. You get a positive result in this year's NCAA tournament, and you're really – like the basketball heads are seeing it. The people who pay attention to the sport know. Uh, but I think you really can break out and steal the eyes of uh, you know the casual fans with a positive result in March. Okay, so let's talk about March years just real quick before we wrap up this specific Saturday talk. Mark Sears uh, with 23 points on Saturday, four rebounds, four assists. He was uh, four of seven. It was effortless, 16 points in the first half. Uh, and really, he's just a guy that's been – not really, I won't say disrespected, but he hasn't really received any respect uh, from the national media. He's leading the SEC in scoring. Yeah, that's more than Dalton Connect. Uh, and he is driving the team that's in first place uh, with six games left. Left. He's been playing uh, at such a high level that, that, that really it's been un a little bit unfortunate to see uh, the lack of respect given to Mar to Mark Sears uh, as far as you know not being being left off of some of these national awards. And on Saturday, he was left off of, uh, I mean, I guess it's a game day TV gimmick, and, and it is what it is for television. But but you look at uh, you look at what happened on, on Saturday. It was NBA All Star Weekend. The college game day theme was let's pick All Star teams in college basketball, and Mark Shears wasn't available, uh, and he had outscored you know through half the guys that were on the list. 
Alabama sitting at 10 and two with Mark Sears leading you. And we were talking about it with some of the guys in, in the media, why uh, he hasn't gotten the respect that he probably deserves. Uh, look, he's been shooting at such a high rate uh, from, 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 from the floor. Let me see if I can find, if, if I can pull that real quick, if I can pull up our man, Mark Sears uh, from the three point line. Yeah. Mark Sears, uh, he's averaging 20.6 points per game. Now that's point, uh, a race, just a hair from what he was on Saturday. Uh, and from, from the uh he's 45 percent from behind the arc 45 percent from behind the arc he's an 86 percent free throw shooter so he's efficient there and he's 51 percent from the floor as a whole so he's not shooting you out of any basketball games my, my my theory with mark sears and i've shared it with you guys before and you can share with me why you think mark sears might be left off of uh the national list or why be well, why he might be left uh you know not be thought of by by in and some of the nationalists with the Bob Cousy Award uh, or even with the Wooden Award. Uh, hopefully he's going to be uh, honored or in consideration with SEC Player of the Year. But I, but I believe, or it's my theory, that Dalton Connect is going to win SEC Player of the Year uh, just because of what I'm, what, 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 how I'm about to articulate this. And maybe, maybe I don't do a good enough job. But if you are creating a player, if you're creating a guard, uh, Mark Sears doesn't look like any of the guards or any of the players that you would – create uh you have if you're familiar with nba 2k you know the, the the video game series you can make players basically think of it as a lab and i'm gonna create a point guard i'm not gonna make him at six foot uh and, and but now i'm gonna give him mark sears shooting ability but i'm not gonna make him right there at six foot i'm not gonna get make him to diminutive status uh I think that that plays a large part into why Mark Sears doesn't get recognized as one of these premier players, because I think that, and secondarily, I think the national media, or I think the uh, the people who are paying attention to basketball and voting on these awards, they kind of see Alabama's offense as a little bit of spammy, a little bit as, oh, you know, you just get a bunch of three-point shots up. Uh, you just have more spacing on the floor, Mark Sears, because of the three-point shooters. Uh, you're just not as good as, so, you know, you're creating based on the system you're living in the system uh look i think that mark needs more respect than than, than he's getting but I think the main reason that he's not getting respect is due to the fact that he doesn't look like a superstar. You talk about Dalton Connect, you think about Janai Broom, the other two guys that are probably in contention for SEC Player of the Year. Dalton Connect is what six foot six. He's shooting three point shots. He he's driving to the hole. He's dunking. Now Mark is doing the same exact things. He's actually scoring more than Dalton Connect. And Alabama basketball has had more success than Tennessee just by hair this year. But Dalton Connect looks like he's going to fit into the NBA a whole lot better than Mark Sears. And so, therefore, he gets more love. He's going to get a little more edge. I think that that's going to uh, give – I, 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 really, I really think that the NBA, the lack of, oh, how do we see Mark Sears fitting into the NBA? And really, it is it is tough to see him fitting into the NBA. But there are guys who are in the NBA right now who play the way that Mark Sears plays, who are the body shape and the body style that Mark Sears are. Now, it's not the Brandon Miller. It's not the, you know, LaMelo Ball. It's not the who are the all-stars that you saw this past weekend. Uh, it's not the Kevin Durant. It's not the LeBron Jameses. And it's not even really the Damian Lillards, but it's kind of like a Jalen Brunson. Uh, you look at what Jalen Brunson has done with the New York Knicks. Now he is getting, I mean, the Knicks have got added a lot around him, but he, he controls the game at his own pace. He's very strong on the ball. He's a good shooter. He's a real good free throw shooter. He's good for, he's dangerous behind the arc, but he basically runs the game. He allows the game to come to him uh, from, from the standpoint, uh, from the professional level and body style. They are, uh, they match up very similarly. Now, Jalen Brunson uh, was very successful at Villanova, went to Dallas Mavericks, and he got, got traded away from the Dallas Mavericks and has turned himself into the next level. Like He's, he's taken himself into the all-star level. He was probably, what, a top – 35, 40 player uh, when he was with the Ma Mavericks. Now he's probably in the top 20s. Mark Sears can do the same thing. His 
career path, his ascension, his game has grown each and every year. Uh, and even this year, he's improved his ability to finish at the rim and his shooting has gotten just that much more dangerous. I think that Mark Sears could see himself on a path like Jalen Brunson. And while he doesn't look like the typical NBA all-star, and that's probably why he's not getting a lot of the uh, a lot of the national love and national attention, because, you know, you think about him, him in draft stock, he's probably not going to be drafted. He might be a second round pick, but, uh, but, 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 but there's a decent chance. I mean, you might be able to uh, put up a pretty decent NIL deal. I think that he still has one more year left of eligibility. If you wanted to explore that here with the Crimson Tide. I think Mark Sears has a path to become an NBA player and become a, 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 a to follow the Kyra Lewis's, the J.D. Davison's, the Colin Sexton's, the guards who have gone into the NBA from Alabama. Uh, it's just going to might take him a little bit longer to get there, but but I really think that that is really the reason why he doesn't get the national media, the national attention. All right, let's keep it going here on the Joe Gaither Show. And we appreciate everybody watching us on YouTube, uh, watching us on Facebook and on Twitter. You can find us at Joe Gaither 6 and leave us your comment, question, query, and complaint. Let's co- let's talk about the rest of the SEC as a whole on Saturday. It was a huge, huge day on Saturday. Uh, look, uh, you had Tennessee beating Vanderbilt. We called that. Tennessee beat the brakes off them. Florida barely beat Georgia. We uh, we called the Florida win. Mississippi State beat Arkansas. We, we, we called that as well. And Ole Miss barely beat beat Missouri. Missouri, oh, lowly Missouri, is 0-12 now, 0-12 in the SEC. Are they going to be 0-18? Oh, poor Missouri. Let's see if we can't find Missouri's schedule and find out if they're going to be 0-18 to, 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 to finish their year. Uh, here we go. Missouri has how many games left? Six like the rest of us? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, uh, they are against Tennessee midweek. That's going to be a loss. Oh, boy. Then they're going to be at Arkansas. Give them a coin flip coin flip game they could they might be able to win that game then they're at florida that's going to be a loss then they're they're home against old miss they just lost at uh on the road to old miss barely by three uh you might give them a coin flip there and then they're uh, against auburn at home they're going to lose and then they go on the road to lsu so they got two coin flip games left out of their six and goodness gracious you hope you pray i mean i'm not really pulling for anyone here but you don't want anybody to go winless in the league that'd be horrible dennis gates I really expected more out of the Missouri Tigers this year. It's just shocking, to be honest with you. Uh, Missouri finished their second half of the year so strong last year, and to be 0-12 at this point in the SEC season is just um, – Really kind of shocking, and I, and I don't really understand it. Now, you know, now Missouri has a pretty good recruiting class coming in, so that's giving uh, Dennis Gates a little bit more leash. But uh, we'll see if they can get one SEC win. Now, what we wanted to talk about was LSU beating South Carolina. Just South Carolina. Oh my gosh! You go into Auburn and you get your brains beat in, and then you come back home and you're playing LSU, who's you know a good you no know, L, who's an above average team, who's an okay you know goodish team, uh, d- dangerous enough, obviously. And you allow LSU. Really, I think you let Auburn beat you twice. LSU beats you, uh, and you fall out of really strong contention in the SEC. Now you were sitting there at night. You you're sitting there at nine and two and you're sitting there one game off of Alabama and then you drop two in a row. So you're now nine and four, you're a game and a half behind the Crimson Tide. And you got to remember Alabama has that big old, uh, that big old tiebreaker over the Gamecocks. So like South Carolina to have that kind of a uh, week, pretty rough stuff, honestly. Uh, and, and really it came down to just guard play towards the end of the game. And, and yeah, South Carolina was up at, yeah, I did. I, I remember this. I was, uh, I, I had gotten home for this. Uh, South Carolina was up like 14 points at halftime. Uh, and LSU just erased it and overcame the deficit. They, they, they were up what? No, seven, excuse me. They were up seven at halftime. Uh, so it wasn't that, it, it wasn't quite double digits, but LSU erasing a deficit and getting a huge win, uh, huge win. And, and South Carolina may be showing us who they are, who they, th- who they are, who we thought they were. Uh, so South Carolina losing and giving Alabama a cushion. The biggest game, the biggest game of the weekend was obviously Kentucky going into Auburn. And Kentucky winning 70 to 59. Uh, what do you want to know about this? What, 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 what really? Uh, Kentucky's not gonna win the SEC regular season. But they have started to put some things together, and Alabama goes on the road to Kentucky, what, next Saturday? This coming up Saturday? Yeah, Kentucky, uh, yeah, this coming up Saturday. 
they've started to put some things together since the Gonzaga loss, and maybe it's just a, a okay, a, a one week, a good strong week for the young kids, but they beat Ole Miss uh, by double digits, and then they go into the jungle, and they end, they end all. They end Auburn's uh, home home winning streak. Uh, Auburn hadn't lost at home since uh, since last season when Alabama beat them at home. Uh, so it's uh, just incredible for them to go go in there and do that. Uh, I want to ask you if, uh, if, if if look they held Auburn to fifty nine points. Has 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 Kentucky found themselves defensively, and that's really been their biggest issue this year. Kentucky has had a really strong offense throughout the year, but defensively not so much. Uh, insert Ugano. Unienso. Let me make sure we say it again. U- Ugano Unienso has been inserted into the Kentucky lineup, and he's got what, what ten blocks against uh, the Ole Miss Rebels uh, last midweek. He's been dominating the mid the, the, in the paint. Now he's not really a skilled offensive player, but he gives Kentucky this offensive an- uh, the defensive anchor that they really have been lacking this year. Uh, and you lean on Antonio Reeves, you lean on Reeves Shepard on the offensive end, and you, you, they've been able to kind of uh, play these games. Now it's impressive to go in, in, and beat Auburn. It really, really means Alabama's, be, you know, Alabama probably looking at a really big challenge on Saturday. A challenge that there, you already knew you were going to have a challenge going into uh, to Kentucky, but Kentucky had kind of fallen on some hard times. Now they've won uh, three out of their last four. Uh, I guess you're always going to beat Vanderbilt, but three out of their last four, they're going to LSU midweek before they host Alabama. I think Kentucky defensively, that might be one to to worry about uh, as they start to find themselves. Uh, it's Maybe a little bit too little too late for Kentucky uh, to win the league as they've what they're at uh they're at uh eight and four in the league so you have that four loss mark that might be a little too much to overcome but who do they have coming up left uh, LSU Alabama State Arkansas Vanderbilt and Tennessee really really favorable rest of the season schedule for the Kentucky Wildcats uh, with Alabama and Tennessee being the hardest games but the rest of them looking very very winnable uh, if they're able to beat Alabama and Alabama Alabama slips up another one, so you know you never know what will happen. Uh, I guess they're not out of it yet mathematically, but looking you know behind the eight ball, and maybe they found themselves at the exact right time. Bruce Pearl in a t-shirt. I know it was for out for outlive or outlive, uh, however you want to pronounce it. The uh, the Auburn against uh, cancer, uh, the Auburn basketball foundation against cancer. But Bruce Pearl in a t-shirt. Come on, man. Uh, you're you're on national TV. I guess the t-shirt did look fine. It wasn't like a uh, gaudy t-shirt uh but come on now we we, we gotta be, be be wearing some sort of collar on the sidelines uh unless you're celebrating something uh i don't know i, I wasn't a big fan of bruce pearl in a t-shirt and then you know losing the game i guess i was a fan of that from an alabama perspective but uh if you're gonna put on a t-shirt and if you're going to have a big old rally uh against you know, a blue blood in the conference, a big old rally against cancer. Come on, have the team show up. Uh, and they really did not do that this weekend. So uh, Kentucky beating uh, beating Auburn, giving Alabama another game edge uh, over them in the conference. And LSU beating South Carolina, giving the Crimson Tide a really, really nice Saturday. Uh, the only other news on Saturday for Alabama basketball was really uh, the NCAA putting out their seeding. The NCAA putting out their top 16 seeds. And look, it's already kind of changed with Purdue losing to Ohio State, but Alabama receiving a number three seed, uh, Alabama receiving a number three seed, and really what I want to think about is does Alabama have a whole lot of room to move up? And it's going to be difficult to do that. Alabama uh, coming in at the number nine overall seed, Tennessee at the number six seed, perhaps you can get over them, but the rest of the guy, the rest of the teams above you are going to be really challenging to, uh, to, 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 to jump over. You look at Purdue who beat you. They're going to have to fall off a cliff uh, for, for them to, uh, for, 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 for you to jump over them. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, even though they did lose to Ohio state, UConn is going to, uh, so subsequently, also going to have to fall off a cliff. But UConn's what nine and two in quad one games. Purdue is nine and three now. Houston uh, is also you know you, you you haven't played Houston or UConn, but they've had great seasons. Look, they're pretty much locked into three number one overall seeds right there. Then the rest of the uh, one seeds are kind of up in there, up in the air. You've got Arizona right now listed as that fourth seed, fourth number one overall seed. Arizona beat you on a neutral court. Alabama, uh, you're probably not going to jump over them unless something really really wild happens with the Wildcats. North Carolina, uh, they've kind of had a little bit of you know some ups and downs this year, but 
uh, I think maybe if you if you if you go on a uh, what six game win streak from the Alabama perspective and then win the SEC title, you might be able to jump a North Carolina, uh, Tennessee. You probably you know, Tennessee is definitely jumpable. We'll say that jumpable uh, on the seed line. You beat Tennessee at home in, in a couple of weeks, and you can continue your winning streak from an Alabama perspective. Uh, you can jump Tennessee. Marquette and Kansas are going to be really challenging. I think Kansas is going to be really challenging to jump. Marquette maybe a little more likely. Marquette with another matchup against UConn, maybe another loss. Again, two of the Huskies will we'll see them slide. And so that's what, three teams that you might have a chance of jumping that puts you up to the number six line, and that gives you a two seed. So look, is it possible that Alabama gets two seed? Maybe. Alabama with a three right now is, is a great great year. When you go back to the earlier conversation, everything that NATO has lost, and you come back from a number one overall seed to a to a three seed, unbelievable consistency. And that's what you need to have to have a, a, a real basketball program. And I think NATO is showing you that Alabama basketball is that. Now you still got, what, three, four-ish weeks left until uh, Selection Sunday. And so we'll see how the Crimson Tide continues to go if they can uh, handle their business in the last six games. I hope, you know, I think five and one might be a realistic goal for the Crimson Tide over the last six games. And we'll see if they are able to do that. They will win the SEC. All right, let's start flipping the football just a little bit. Let's start flipping the football, and we'll do that by using a bridge to our friend Nick Saban. Nick Saban was at the Alabama basketball game on Saturday. Did you see him on the uh, right there, sitting there front row? Nick Saban with Miss Terry. And look, I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to comment. Look, you had a lot of guys, a lot of great faces in the crowd on Saturday. Nick Saban, you had Herb Jones, Noah Clowney was back from for the uh, for the for, for the NBA All Star Weekend. Uh, they had weekend off so they were back you saw Noah Gurley was in the crowd the entire the 2004 Alabama basketball team Chuck Davis you saw Antoine Petway was it what was there Mark Godfrey was there you had a, a big contingent from the 04 team the Sandersons were there as they were honoring coach Wimp Sanderson in the Bryant Museum it was a huge weekend uh right there in Coleman Coliseum and I think this was really uh, interesting that Coach Saban came back for this weekend. I don't know if he had anything else already on the calendar or if he was just out of golf tournaments. This was just an awful weekend. You can see the golf tan already on Coach Saban's ankles. Uh, and more power to you, Coach. Play as much as you want to. Do what you want to do in your own retirement. If I were retired, that would be what I would want to do. Uh, but just cool to see him come into town this weekend. Uh, you heard Nate Oates and Mark Sears uh, talk about what Coach Saban talked to the team about. About. He came and addressed the basketball team. I think that this is what Coach Saban is going to end up being over the next, uh, over the course of his retirement. Not really in Tuscaloosa daily perhaps, uh, as you've seen him all over the country, mostly in Florida and a little bit out west playing golf. Uh, but, 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 but I think he's going to be in Tuscaloosa for select events, for select weekends. And, uh, you, you know, you've already seen him line up, uh, line up opportunities with college game day, so he's not going to be in Tuscaloosa very often for game days to watch the Crimson Tide. Now, I'm sure he's going to watch Alabama very closely for his job and for enjoyment, but I, I think this shows kind of – a little bit, a microcosm of what he's going to be for Alabama, what he's going to be for the athletic department, not just for uh, the football team, but for the entire athletic department. I think he's going to let the department know, hey, I'm going to be in this week. I'm going to be around the house. I'm going to be on the lake. I'm going to be doing whatever I'm going to be doing. Uh, do, you know, it, can I be of service or how, how can I check in with, with the uh, with, with different teams? How can I check? In? I mean, obviously, he's going to be really plugged into the football program, but to the other teams. And so it's really fun to see him there on Saturday uh, supporting the, the, the basketball team. All right, let's finish this bad boy up by going into the football staff. On Friday, oh, we talked about it. We talked about uh, in the vacancies for the tight end role and the offensive coordinator. Uh, we talked about how you lost Scott Huff and you lost, uh, you, you know, you, tight end role and offensive line coach. Not sorry, not offensive coordinator. The offensive coordinator vacancy, Ryan Grubb created the vacancy with the tight ends coach and the offensive line coach, taking Scott Huff with him. You got Chip. 
Kapilovic uh, from Ohio, from Michigan State coming in to coach the uh, the offensive line. And so what do we know about him? Uh, he's 55 years old. He's been coaching offensive line his entire life. He's been the run game coordinator uh, for Michigan State the last, what, three, four seasons. He was hired by Baylor in December uh, to be their offensive line coach. Uh, but uh, he was with Baylor for, what, two months? Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess two months, January and part of February. Uh, before Kalen DeBoer said, no, no, do you want to come coach in the SEC? Uh, so Chris Kapilovich uh, comes to become your offensive line coach. And look, I'm not going to sit here and let you know that, oh, he's going to be great or he's going to be horrible. Uh, he doesn't have a ton of ties to the SEC, but you're just going to have to see it play out. You're just going to have to see him adapt to the Kalen DeBoer system and see it play out on the field to start to get a read on it. How is he going to be able to recruit? Uh, you don't don't really know I mean, you, you, and then how's it going to play out on the field can we be honest with you with, with, with ourselves uh the offensive line hasn't been good for the last three years in different in different areas in different areas yes i know caden proctor was a freshman uh this past year i know chris owens you know you, you had the big hole on right tackle two years prior you couldn't get a run game push for, for you know for anything the last couple of seasons uh, you, you know, I, I I think that anything is better than what you've had uh, from the from the run game perspective. I know Eric Wolford was a really good recruiter, uh, but did he get the most out of the offensive lineman? I think that you can uh, debate that amongst yourselves. Uh, so we'll see if Chris Kapilovich will get uh, will get more out of the offensive line room than you've had uh, as he comes from Michigan State. He spent also time with Col- at Colorado, at North Carolina, at Southern Miss, so a little bit of time in the South there, Missouri State, Alabama State, uh, and then uh, going back all the way to 1992, starting his uh, starting his career uh, in high school, Deer Valley High School offensive coordinator, uh, and then he got into the college game in 19. 19- 98 at Phoenix College as offensive line coach. So he's been in the game for for quite some time, uh, and so we'll see how he comes into the Alabama uh, offensive line room. Now, uh, on the flip side, Brian Ellis is a guy you've got a little more information on and and a guy that you've got to probably be excited about. Uh, Brian Ellis becomes your tight ends coach. He's hired away from Georgia Southern, Gaddock, go Eagles. Uh, I've got a lot of family friends who enjoy go- Georgia Southern, so we, we enjoy them uh, just on the side. But Brian Ellis comes from Georgia Southern. He comes from UAB. Play- he played football at UAB. He's kind of a Southern boy. You know, uh, he's, he, he's, he's exactly kind of what you're looking for as maybe a young up-and-comer coach. Uh, now, he played quarterback at UAB 2007 to 2011. He's 35 years old so he's still a young guy he spent he, right out of, right out of college he jumped into coaching UAB graduate assistant and now he's been an offensive coordinator at a couple of different places and so he's taking a little bit of a demotion responsibility wise but he's taking a huge jump up as far as uh, as far as the program now he spent time at Western Kentucky uh, as a uh, offensive coordinator quarterbacks coach running backs coach uh, passing game coordinator then he went to USC with Clay Hilton uh, as an offensive analyst and then a quarterbacks coach and then he went to went back to western kentucky and then he's been at georgia southern the last two seasons as offensive coordinator so he's been a part of uh some staffs that, that have had some some good offenses uh let's see brian ellis yeah there we go uh he, he put put a top 30 passing offense last season for uh georgia southern and then he scored over 44 points a game uh as offensive coordinator from western kentucky the, uh during uh, what 2019 to 2021 so he doesn't really have a whole a lot of uh crossover. Neither of these two guys have a whole lot of crossover with Kalen DeBoer anywhere else, uh, but I kind of think that that's a good thing. I kind of think that Kalen DeBoer, uh, that just shows that he's not going with the good old the good old boy system uh and we'll just have to see how these play, how these guys play out look none of us are in practice yet none of us really know these guys quite yet you're gonna have to see them in front of a microphone or get to know them uh and see how their positions play out going forward to judge how, how these hires are going to be I hate honestly I hate saying this is an a plus hire this is a b plus hire this is an f hire that's a terrible way to go about things because these guys have been hired for all of well I'm 
sure the paperwork's not even processed at this point. Uh, our man Ryan Fowler from Tide 100.9 here in Tuscaloosa reported that this morning at about 8, 9 in the morning, somewhere in that range. So you, you, these guys have been you know, reportedly on the job for less than 12 hours here. So how can you uh, give them any sort of grade? You never know how scenario, how circumstances are going to fit together. Maybe uh, they come to Tuscaloosa and it's a perfect fit for everyone. And wherever they were coaching before, they coach 10 times better here or vice versa. They come to Tuscaloosa and they get crunched under the pressure cooker and it doesn't really work out for them. You never really know. Uh, obviously, we hope for the best for everybody, uh, but you just never really know. So it's very silly, in my opinion, to give grades to coaching hires. Uh, I think that these guys, you know, obviously impressed Coach Caitlin DeBoer in their uh, in their interviews, and we'll see how they fit with the rest of the staff. you got to, uh, at this point, be all in on Caitlin DeBoer's vision, uh, and his staff is now complete with adding Chip Kapilovich as the offensive line coach and Brian Ellis as the tight ends coach. Let's finish this bad boy up uh, with softball and baseball. But before we do that, we're going to tell you about Druid City Music Hall. Druid City Music Hall is the premier place to watch live music here in Tuscaloosa. They're located right there on the strip, right there next to the Waffle House, so you know exactly where it is on the strip. Now, unfortunately, uh, the Tuesday show that they were going to have this week is canceled. Oh, the band had had a little bit of an issue. Uh, the Brook and the Bluff, I think, had a little bit of a sickness in their, in their band, and I was really looking forward to being out there on Tuesday, but they're going to still have shows on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So you're going to want to get their tickets right now. Uh, you're going to have uh, 49, 49 Winchester on Thursday. You're going to have Pigeons playing ping pong on Wednesday. And then I'm going to be out there on Friday to see the Stew. So three shows right in a row uh, at Druid City Music Hall. You can check them out at druidcitymusic.com. Uh, get your tickets right now. Uh, you, you've got a lot of different very uh, var varieties of music uh, the next three nights playing down there at Druid City Music Hall on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week, so make sure you check them out online at druidcitymusic.com. Uh, let's round it out to talk softball and baseball just real quick because we are not quite dialed in yet on the Diamond Sports. Uh, just on the softball side, 10-0, and winning the Easton Mama Bash 5-0 this weekend, but low scoring. Again, you're worried about the hitting. You're worried about the hitting. You're 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 playing uh you're you're playing teams that you should be probably beating fairly handily. You know, obviously, I'm not a softball expert. You're playing St. Thomas, who you ended up getting uh, seven and eight runs against, respectively. So that's great. But when you're playing Virginia, you win three to one and three to two. I mean, they're not. The greatest team in the world, are they? You're playing Southern Indiana. You win two to nothing on Sunday. So great to see the pitching and the defense. Uh, always a staple of the Patrick Murphy era. Uh, the pitching and the defense, you got it, but you got to get better, uh, put up bigger numbers at the plate uh, going forward, at least for the casual fan or the casual observer like myself. So we're going to uh, see Alabama softball in action again on Wednesday. They're taking on uh, North Alabama here in Tuscaloosa at 3 o'clock, and then you're going to see them in the Green and Gold Classic this coming up weekend in Birmingham. They're playing up at UAB. They're playing UAB, Western Carolina, Bradley, and North Alabama all up at the Green green and gold classic in Birmingham. Now, on the baseball side of things, the baseball boys went 3-0, uh, handling Manhattan College, uh, winning, what, 4 to nothing, 15 to nothing, and 11-8. to So you get a lot of offense and a little bit of pitching on a couple of nights. Uh, it's, a good, it's good to start 3-0. Manhattan College obviously isn't Ole Miss, LSU, isn't Vanderbilt or Tennessee, uh, but it's great to start 3-0, uh, and it's good to get the bats going, especially on Saturday, uh, Saturday over there in the Joe. The guys are going to be back in action on Tuesday and on Wednesday. Midweek action uh, against Middle Tennessee on Tuesday and Alabama State on Wednesday uh, before taking on a Friday, uh, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series right here at the Joe against Valparaiso. So you're going to be able to see the guys uh, five more times this week uh, as they are really ramping up baseball season. A 3-0 and start. Uh, nice to see Alton Davis shutting it down. Uh, you can read all about that at BamaCentral and BamaCentral.com. Our guys, Will Miller and 
and Cam Rankin covering all things Alabama baseball for BamaCentral.com. Uh, let's get out of here real quick with a little gymnastics note as the ladies were off uh, for a little bit of time. Now they're taking part in – where's my tab? Right uh, there. Yeah, uh, right there. They're taking part in the Texas Western uh, – the Texas Women's Quad Meet. They're taking on Texas Women's University, Arkansas, and Arizona right, right now. Uh, right now on a Monday mid-afternoon, and then they're going to be back in SEC action on Friday uh, right here in Coleman Coliseum against Georgia at 7 p.m. I think that might be the Power Pink Meet. Yes, it is the Power Pink Meet. Uh, you can see them on Friday uh, as they are taking on the Georgia Bulldogs. We're going to get out of here for the day. We'll keep covering Alabama basketball, Alabama football, the coaching hires. We'll try to get to know the coaches a little bit further and see what they are going to bring to the program. We welcome Brian Ellis, tight ends coach from Georgia Southern, and Chip Kapilovich, offensive line coach from Michigan State by way of Baylor, uh, rounding out the Kalen DeBoer staff. I'm Joe Gaither. You've been watching the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. We'd appreciate you to like, rate, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or on Amazon. You can uh, check it out on Bama Central. Subscribe to the Bama Central YouTube channel. You will get more than just myself. You'll get all the press conferences that we attend. You'll get the Just a Minutes. You'll get a lot of an- uh, a lot of great coverage right there the Alabama Crimson Tide on the Bama Central YouTube channel. You can find me at JoeGate36 on any of the social media feeds that you like the best, and I will connect with you right there. We can talk sports. We can talk life, whatever you like. Uh, we've had a lot of fun today. You heard my dog and cat in the background fighting in the first half of the show. I apologize about that if that distracted you. We talked Alabama basketball heavy at the beginning, a little bit about Alabama football coaches, a little less about Bama on the diamond, and then we rounded it out with, with the gymnastics note. For you guys, the listener and the viewer, I love you guys so, so much. I appreciate you all the mess. Uh, you can find me at Joe Gaither 6, and I'll be back with another edition of the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com tomorrow right here on all of the channels that we just mentioned. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, guys. Thanks for joining us on today's edition of the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. Keep up with Joe on all his social media pages at JoeGaither6. Subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and be sure to read us daily at BamaCentral.com.